Thanks. Good afternoon. Let me just start by taking you back in my history. I've been working for IBM longer than I probably ought to admit at this point, but since 1976 at IBM Boca Raton, it was hard to find photos because we didn't have digital cameras back then and you needed a camera pass to bring a pa camera online. And if I have actual photos, they are faded and lost. So I found this one on the web and borrowed it from someone I don't know who. And that was probably the building I worked in because it, it doesn't connect to anything else. And one of the interesting things about Boca Raton was that we routinely had rain like we had here a couple weeks ago at lunchtime every day. And you had to run outside because why would you build a building for the climate? Anyway, big building. There was a twin of it across the lake that was connected to the factory. We had a factory back then. And my team was a fairly large team. We were working on an operating system for a mini computer. And there were probably 100, 150 people involved in it. And we were all in the same wing of that building on two floors. The operating system people were all on the second floor. And the rest of the group was on the third floor. And we rarely talked to the people in the other group because they were all the way upstairs. Sometimes it was really difficult if you had a bug. You had to prove that it was theirs before they take it. And that would require a lot of trips back and forth. We didn't have email. We had a lot of me we had meetings, not that many. These days, my, my calendar is basically driven by meetings. But we had a few. But they were always with people who were probably within 100 meters of us. Maybe some steps, but close. There were other parts of the Boca Raton site. There were other parts of the site a little bit farther away in Boca. There were lots of IBM buildings. IBM was all over the, com all over the country, all over the world. Almost all of our meetings were with people we could walk to see in five minutes. If there were meetings with non-IBMers, you had to go there or they had to come here. We didn't have conference calls. We didn't have any kind of teleconferencing. So it was a scare, it was a painful thing to do. Conference rooms were one of the scarcest resources available to us, along with computer time and other facilities, because it was an era where things were different. But meetings really weren't what drove our time. What really drove it was fighting the computer, getting time on the computer, debugging with very primitive tools, kind of like what you're doing now. Our computers, we didn't have them in our offices. They were all refrigerator size rack mounted with a stupid little display with 16 LEDs, and that was how you debugged. And they were in a shared raised floor lab, again, near our offices, five minutes away. You had to reserve time. We didn't have terminals in our offices until far later, so you had to get those. They were in a shared area. You were always working with other people. Pretty much no matter what you were doing, there was somebody else within hollering distance who could help you or hear you as, as appropriate or see your password when it was changed. That was always exciting. And we didn't even have email, as I said. We weren't, we weren't unusual in that. IBM had hundreds of thousands of people. In North America, at least, almost all of them worked at a fixed location. They worked in a development lab. That was, that was my experience, a research lab. We had a lot of people whose job was assembling computers. We did manufacturing in the US. We had lots of salespeople, so they worked out of a sales office. They would travel to customer locations and physically present to them. Or we had a lot of people whose job it was to keep the, our systems running at customer locations. And there'd be an IBM room, a so-called blue room, at a customer. I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic before going to IBM. We had an IBM shop, and there was one room that was reserved for the IBMers. It even had an IBM phone in it, so we didn't get to go in there. So you really worked in physical proximity and physical closeness, and you always worked with other people. And there was a lot of socializing. There was a lot of bonding. We had lots of parties after work because we couldn't have parties during work because IBM had a very strict no alcohol policy in those days. 
and to celebrate lots of things, celebrate promotions, celebrate development milestones. You got t-shirts. It was kind of like Silicon Valley, but much drier and much earlier. So that was my life back then. Today, I still work in an IBM location. I work at the Almaden Research Center in San Jose, and that's another photo I swiped off the web. But that's really what it looks like today, well, in a week or two when it gets green. Very pleasant place, could hold 1,000 people comfortably. We have perhaps 600 people there most of the time. Except a lot of times I wind up working from home. And other times I wind up in a virtual space. Usually not quite that vague. People tell me that they can see me, but I can't see me because of some software difficulties. So let me just calibrate for a second. How many of you play World of Warcraft, just to start? OK. Used to, right, OK. How many of you spend time in Second Life? Zero. OK. Facebook? MySpace? Didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> Twitter? OK. What's, what social networks are catching on that I've, that I've lost, that I haven't caught up with yet? Any, anything else significant? Because we tend to be a little slower sometimes. OK, and I, and I need to know where to spy. So I spend a lot of time in those locations. But really, where I spend my time is on that thing, my phone. I have a headset, thank goodness. And I spend most of my time dealing with my email because I don't ever meet people face to face because my environment's changed. Some of it's because I've moved on in the company and moved on in my career, so some of it is a natural progression, but a lot of it is that the way we do business today has changed substantially. My manager's office is in Somers, New York, about an hour north of LaGuardia Airport. I've been to Somers. I've never been in her office. Used to be back when I was in Boca, one of the skills that really helped me was being able to read upside down when I was visiting my manager. But that doesn't help anymore. She's been to my office, though. If you look in my immediate team, the physically closest teammate I have is in Austin, Texas. And we haven't seen each other personally for three years. And back then, we actually had a different relationship. So it's a very different social environment. The reason I go into my office is so I can see other people, ex-colleagues, sometimes colleagues, people who work in computer science in the usability group who I can chat with, or I have a lucky meeting with at lunch. But I don't have day job meetings there. I haven't had an in-person meeting about my real job. I was going to say in years, but it's not true. I had a team. I ran an internship this summer, and I had my interns, and they were physically there, so we actually met in person. And it was absolutely wonderful having people to work with. But despite the fact that I don't have in-person meetings, about half my calendar is taken up by meetings. And a huge number of those happen at 6 AM. That seems to be the globally friendly hour, 6 AM Pacific time, or 6 PM, or any other time to accommodate teams, because all of our teams are global. They're people from at least three continents on almost everything I do. Used to travel a lot. We've had this recession, and they've cut down on travel. But that's probably going to continue, because we're getting more environmentally sensitive, more sensitive to the carbon impact. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to make a trip across country for a two-hour meeting, which is something I used to do. I don't miss it too much, but sometimes it's very, very ineffective to try to hold long meetings over the phone or even in a virtual space. The good news, though, if you need a conference room, they're there. They're available. No problem. Back in the, old, in the day, I used to have to go hunt for a computer, had to reserve it. We would come in late at night to get time on it. These days, usually it's within reaching distance, right there. And I've got email. In fact, I'm willing to bet I've got email that I haven't seen since I got up this morning. 100% guarantee you that. So I've always got email. And people expect you to respond to it pretty much round the clock, because they're working. And that's a real change in the environment. And by the way, 
I'd like this to be interactive. So if I bring up something and you want to talk about it and drill into it or say, no, that's not how it is here, I'd love to hear it. So please feel free to just holler. IBM is no longer office-based. A lot of people do have offices, don't get me wrong, but officially a third of the IBM population is mobile or is work at home. I have a lot of friends who work every day at home. They go into an office very rarely, maybe once every couple of months, and that's only if it's within driving distance. And most of us who really do have offices, who really are office-based, we wind up working at home too, off hours, catching up on email, doing development, what have you. We do still celebrate. That's something that's still important. But it's usually now electronic. It's now mediated. It's rarely in person. And I think that makes a difference. Getting a call congratulating you is great. Getting an email congratulating you for something is great. But it's not the same as sitting and talking with somebody and enjoying an informal moment that really isn't scripted. So a lot has changed, but a lot of things have remained the same. One of them is that business and computing is not an individual sport for the most part. It really is a team sport because projects go on for a long time. They need a lot of people. They need a lot of skills. So you need to collaborate within a team and also between teams as the projects get bigger. And that's difficult. It was difficult in 1976 in Boca Raton. As I said, we had two teams. We were working on the same operating system. But by God, you had to be able to prove where the bug was to turn it over to the other team. Teams are made of people. People are funny. People have quirks. People have preferences. And people are not interchangeable. They have different skills. They have different weaknesses. They have different ways of getting together. You need to work on that. You need to understand that. People tend to work better with people that they know and like. So that if I ask you something, if I ask one of you for something, you ha we have no, no background. You have no idea to, know, to go very far out of your way for me or to expect anything in return or to other than possibly a thank you. Whereas somebody I've worked with for a number of years, I don't necessarily have to ask explicitly for something because they know what I want or I know what they want. So we reinforce each other. And there's a continuing relationship. It's not like the prisoner's dilemma in game theory where, are you familiar with that one? OK. If the prisoners know each other, know that they are going to communicate afterwards, you get a different result than if they're playing in isolation. You want to optimize the whole group, not your own individual thing. But that's harder when your paths just cross briefly. So interacting with people in more than just transactional ways really does help you know them and helps build the social capital that lets you get things done more effectively, encourages collaboration. So given that direct contact has gotten more limited, and IBM is not alone in this by any means. There's less travel everywhere. And my personal opinion, as I said, is it's not the recession has been driving it down, but it's not the end of the road by any means. We're going to be travel limited for a long, long time. So how do you build that social capital when you don't actually work with the other people, when they're not there, when their voice is on the phone, when their presence is in the ether? How do you, how do you widen it? Do you ever team with people? Uh, I'm not familiar with what happens in the computer science curriculum here. So are you generally doing individual projects or team projects? OK, individual. As you go forward, does it get more team? Are there more team projects, George? OK. OK, and when you do have the team projects, how do you build the team? Is it, is it assigned? What? Friends. Friends, right. So you built based on relationships you've got and knowledge you've got. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, right? Do you wor ever have to work with people off campus? OK, once. How did it work? OK, somebody you knew beforehand? OK, so you, again, you were dealing with no, nah. well. <laughs> no, we had our department chosen from the undergrad class. I was teaching the math part, so I already knew how to get a hold of each other. So it wasn't like, I don't really know you. We need to figure out how to do this. Uh, so we already 
Right. And, and so you, you, you were able to work on that. For my Extreme Blue team this summer, I had four students from four different campuses. They hadn't met before, but they were all placed in the same hotel to live for the summer, residential hotel. And they decided that the way that they were going to bond was they were going to cook for each other. And they had teen meals once a week, and it really seemed to work. They really got, they really got together. Now they've scattered their four ways, and they've fallen out of practice. And it's, but they were able to take advantage of really building social cohesion in the real world. So how do you do it when you don't have that kind of direct contact? And it's not a new problem. Here's a letter from Abraham Lincoln to a general during the world, during the Civil War, and there's a letter from Churchill. I think I'm not quite sure who it's to. I think it, oh, Herring, it, looking for things. They had relationships in advance, but they were dealing in an area where communication was slow. Letters took a long time to cross the Atlantic or to cross to the to cross the lines, and so you you didn't have the immediate response we're used to. It was hard to dis to maintain that cohesion, but it was possible. So it's not a new problem by any means, but today it's a more widespread problem. As I said, if I in 1945, I probably wouldn't be dealing with a global team. Even in 1976, I wasn't dealing with a global team. My bosses weren't dealing with global teams. We really were localized. But today. This is a tool we use called Team Analytics. And it, I took a meeting I was on. Yes, it was at 6 AM. And this is where the people were positioned all over the world. So we got four continents. IBM doesn't have much in Africa. And this particular call didn't have people from Australia, but it's not unusual to have people from Australia. It's really unusual that we didn't have anybody from China on this call. So this was the invitee list. And it was convenient for the people in the Northeast US, and not bad for people in England. And after that, it gets a little iffy. Uh, being in California has its own special challenges when you're dealing with the global pain team. We have a tool to compute time zone pain. Sadly, and you notice the globally friendly hour for this call. They, they, they even have the nerve to say it's the globally friendly hour. Sadly, this tool was built by somebody who works in the Almaden lab. He must like mornings more than I do. So there's really not a substitute for real human contact. But we can't have real human contact in every case. We never could. So how do we use technology to extend it? If, you, if I do actually have a chance to meet with you, how can I get that meeting to last longer so that maybe I don't see you for a year and a half in person, but we've established the connection, and we can maintain it more strongly than we can with email. Email sometimes turns into flames. Perhaps you've noticed that. Because it's easy to get disconnected. Even telephone calls sometimes go that way, especially in a conference call when people have bad phones. So how do you, if you don't ever get to meet the person, how do you increase the degree of involvement when you really aren't going to get to meet the person for various reasons? And language difficulties. IBM is a global, com global company. We have people for whom English is not a first language and is not even really a preferred second language. And that, again, has changed since 1976. I remember my first trip overseas to an, not, to an IBM location in Germany, and there were IBMers from the US who were there on assignment. They were spending two years. They hadn't bothered to learn any German because they didn't need to. They could live in an English-speaking bubble inside work, and they got by with each other outside work. So, which made no sense to me. If you're going to travel somewhere, why wouldn't you want to actually experience where you're going? But it was OK for them. So, And for those of you who don't read Hebrew, is there anyone in the room who doesn't know what that is? OK. That's actually from, the, from Genesis. That's the story of the Tower of Babel in the original Hebrew. So we'll get back to that. Let me, let me talk about how I do this. It's not the same that everybody does, but how do I stay in contact with my extended team? By the way, I don't manage anyone. That's, so I have a slightly different problem than people who do manage. They have to have an even more structured way of maintaining that contact. But I get mentored by people. I mentor people. 
I team with people. I try to con people into doing work for me, working on projects that are important to me, buy me, buy me new toys. So you need some social capital to get that done. The obvious way is phone calls. I, I live on the phone. We have lots of teleconferences. I remember when they get, said, if you're an executive or a manager, you can have a teleconference number, a conference bridge that people can call into. But we, we want to really limit that. And now I think they hand you a phone number as you walk in the door, because you have to have it because you're working with so many people. And nobody is ever at a fixed location. And we don't have enough cell phone minutes to go around. Because you, prob you probably all use cell phones as your normal means of contact, right? Right. I, so you have a stable number. I don't. And that's a different and it also doesn't scale to more than two or three people. Instant messaging is another thing we've been using again for about twenty years. And even back in the mainframe days we had a form of it. And that is real important. But there's not a whole lot of richness to instant message communication. You can paste in pictures, you can paste in smileys, but it's a it's a fairly direct thing. Email. Email's rich these days. You can put all that stuff in. We have blogs. We have an internal blogging platform that a lot of people use. And you don't always just write about business there. That tends to give you a lot more impression of things. There's a gentleman, Brian Peacock, in the UK who I don't work with, but I know a lot about. He writes wonderfully rich blog entries about his life at IBM. He had some brain problems, uh, seizures, so how he got back onto the road. And I feel like I know a lot about him. He also writes about Java and mainframe software and consumability. And I have a lot more willingness to understand what he's saying about things because I know more about him. We've had Usenet equivalent inside IBM for, almost, for 30 years, forums we call them. They're like news, news groups. They're much less spammy than the ones you see outside because we don't have people trying to sell you things, thank goodness. And again, they're subject oriented, but you get a sense of people's personality over time. A lot of it is continuing contact. We've moved heavily into video conferencing, Skype, but Skype with better cameras sometimes. We actually have some Cisco telepresence suites, which are supposed to be really good. I haven't gotten to the point to get to use them because you see the other person life size and in full quality. So it's supposed to be very, very engaging. But that's back to a short uh, resource that's in short supply, and it requires that you both be operating at the same time. So for a call to China, somebody's going to be in the middle of the night. We're also using a lot of less traditional tools to help extend the contact. And a lot of these have just grown up. So one of the things that happened a few years ago and it sort of took people by surprise. Our corporate directory has been around for a long time. It used to be just name, phone number, pure text, because it was on mainframe terminals. Eventually, we moved it online into a richer, into a PC environment. And it was still pure text. And eventually, someone came up with the idea, why don't we put pictures? We've got these things that can do pictures. And most people put up pictures. Initially, a lot of people put up pictures that weren't of them. They were all, almost all, in good taste. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I know one guy who put up a picture of Brent Favre three teams ago to represent himself. And that's really changed. Almost everyone uses their own picture. Sometimes I'll have a kid in the picture, so it still shows some personality. But almost everyone uses a picture because it, it's better than an avatar. I mean, it's like, a, it's like an avatar, but it's really business oriented, so your own picture is, true, is more useful. And it's persistent, and it shows up in lots and lots of places, some more, and more show up every day. So if I IM someone, their picture shows up, if they have one. And that really helps, because I IM with people I've never seen. My blog entries show it. The blog central gathering place shows who's been doing things. If there's somebody commenting on your blog, you see their picture. We have a tool called Lotus Communities. And you can build a community. And you know, community is, is stretching it, I would, I would have to say. But you build a community around a topic. So I built one. As I said, I, gave a, I was telling George, I gave a lecture 
last week with a friend on the Getting Things Done system, David Allen's Getting Things Done. And we had a lot of people there, about 200 in person, 400 on the phone, back to that problem. And I built a Lotus community to show, to share the slides, to share the information, and to let people talk to each other. Anyone there shows, sees my picture and I can see theirs. Again, it helps humanize. That list of 40 or 50 people, those are the same people who showed up on that map before. So the team analytics tool pulls together all the people who've been invited to a meeting and shows you their, their faces. Very small, I've shrunken it more to fit here. Their organizational relationship to you, their organizational relationship to each other because IBM is a very organizationally driven company. You have to know where someone is to understand some of the things they're asking. And again, it really helps make a connection. And that's a fairly recent thing. And there are many more, but I ran out of room. We have some collaboration tools that we've developed that have a really clear, obvious business purpose. This is Lotus Connections. That's the base for the communities and the blogs. And it really has an obvious connect, uh, purpose. This is from an external slide, so it's not mine. But you have your profile. That's the blue pages I was talking about. You have blogs that you work with, that you own, that you participate in, that you watch. You've got activities. And this is, this is to get work done. Sometimes it even works. And then we've got some tools that are a whole lot less structured that are more experimental. The research division produced a tool called Beehive, which we've since renamed internally to Social Blue be to avoid confusion with Oracle's external Beehive social networking tool. They copyrighted it first or trademarked it first. And the discussions here are really intended to be exploratory. They're really, I actually tried to hold the meeting, an agenda of a meeting here and maintain it. And let me tell you, it was very frustrating because I was trying to take a tool and bend it into something it wasn't intended for but I wanted to experiment with it. On the other hand, you have people, your current status, kind of like Facebook. This is kind of like an internal Facebook was really the idea. People are encouraged to share photos. People are encouraged to share what they call hive fives. Five little bullet points that have something to do with each other and that you ask a question and then answer it in five bullet points. And a lot of people find this just absolutely enthralling. Note the heavy use of pictures and the heavy and the light use of text. So it's really designed to help connect you to other people informally. And many people find this just absolutely wonderful. I find it a little limiting because I'd really rather be able to deal with people beyond the firewall as well. We have something else. I'm in the uh, IBM Academy of Technology. Until last year, we had an annual meeting in person in the fall where all of us would get together, 300 of us plus about 150 guests. We would discuss, we would develop projects, we would discuss IBM technical issues, the chairman would often come and speak. And it was a three day very intense meeting. We'd start at 7 a.m. and we'd finish at 11 p.m. Last year, due to the economy, we canceled that meeting. This year, we've canceled that meeting. Next year, we've canceled that meeting. And so they decided to bring it Still, they wanted to do the presentations and get people to interact. And so they quickly put together a series of teleconferences and video conferences and events in Second Life last year. And they did this on about six weeks' notice. So it was really, really impressive. And people discovered that while the information was being passed, the socialization wasn't happening. And during the meeting, they rescheduled and said, let's have some just unstructured time in virtual spaces because that's a good place for 20 or 30 people to get together and talk to each other using high quality audio, not teleconference quality audio, not, sit, not half duplex phones. And just, you can represent yourself by an avatar and you can chat and you can talk. And that turned out to be really, really effective. They did one as an experiment and then they said, oh, people like that, let's do more. And this year's academy has three a day scheduled for around the clock, around the time zones. Again, one of the problems is that it's not going to get people who live in different parts of the world together as effectively. 
the odds of my getting onto the 1 a.m. session are fairly limited. Uh, I think zero. I, I've been told zero. <laughs> and, and but I might make the 7 p.m. Certainly, the 3 p.m. is reasonable. So people will talk. People t people have avatars. I I don't spend a lot of time decorating my avatar. The fact that I can't see it has something to do with it, but. I didn't before. But last year, somebody came up with a beer dispenser. He grabbed a beer, and, and everybody was walking around with a beer. It felt much better. It really did make it possible to have conversations that you hadn't planned. As I said, I don't spend a lot of time on Social Blue because I'd rather deal with people in a bigger context outside and also see people who I meet outside IBM. So I spend more time than I probably ought to on Facebook. And not all of it is spying either, only a little. So this was just, I randomly picked when I was putting this presentation together. It turned out I had three sex sections where I had IBMers, colleagues, who were all updated right next to each other. So I didn't have to cut and paste. My Twitter is not, the, not as rich with IBMers, fortunately. But one guy's talking about work. He's at an IBM conference. One person's finished with work, and his next tweet was, I think, martini time. And the third person who actually works at Almond is talking about her five-hour diet or 32-hour diet. And she hasn't killed anyone yet. So it's, you wouldn't see that even on Social Blue. You wouldn't see that. You certainly wouldn't see that in an email or probably not on a conference call because it's not business-like. But it really helps me know, know them better. Matt, who I've known for 15 years and actually have worked with in person a few times, I didn't know he's a geocacher, as am I. He also teaches astronomy at a local college. And I never would have known that from work things. So it really does help add some richness. We've also been working, and this is a project that's in my team, on translation. Because even though most IBMers still do speak English or write English, it's not always comfortable. And so they've built a tool called Enfluent which is text translation. It's crowdsourced. There's a lot of machine assistance, but periodically they'll have a challenge and they'll put out scraps of text and ask people who do know the other language to help translate it into, into English or from English or between languages to improve the quality of the mechanical translation. And it's very, very popular. It apparently is very effective. I'm fortunate in that I haven't had to use it because, and I can't contribute to it because I'm monolingual in the extreme, although I do know Python. So the real key and the thing that all this technology is intended to help is to remember that when you're sending emails or you're on a call and you can't hear the other person very clearly because there's five other people, three of them on cell phones and you can hear traffic, that you've got to remember you're dealing with other people. It's real easy when you're dealing face to face with people to remember because I can see your body language. I can see you blush. I can see you getting angry. I can see you wondering. But on the phone, I don't get that. In an email, I don't get that. So you really have to exert yourself. I find I have to exert myself to remember that there are people out there. This is from a friend. This is from a, uh, someone I mentor. She's been with IBM two, two years. And this presentation is out on SlideShare already. She's going to be giving it at another event that used to be in person and is now remote, on giving remote presentations that really work. And you've got to pre you pretend. If you can see the person on the other end in your mind's eye on the screen, it really helps. If you have the energy, if I'm dealing, I'm here in person, so I'm watching you and I'm hoping, and I'm getting energy from you as you're listening to me and as you're going to ask questions, I hope. That makes a difference. There's a big difference between being on the phone like this and being on the phone like this. Headsets make a difference. Speaker phones even make a difference. Pretend you're there. Make it real. Remember that they're real, and it makes a big difference. So that was what I wanted to go through, and I'm interested in questions. I, I d have been asked to give a, a brief commercial, however, because uh, the reason I'm connected to Sonoma State is through the IBM Academic Initiative. And this is more for the faculty than it is for students, although you should know about it too. And we make it possible for you to use some of our tools and technologies and for free. And there's courses out there that are available self-serve. 
So it's ibm.com slash academic initiative. It's part of the Smarter Planet initiative. And I'll leave that up and take any questions or comments. Or send you off to lunch early. Yeah. How much do I miss the interaction having people every day in person? A lot. That's why I have an office. That's why, even though I don't work with people locally, I've spent the last, since about 1994, most of the time I have not worked with the people at the research center officially. I've been in other parts of the company. But I've kept an office there just so I can interact with people, so I can bounce ideas from them, so I can take advantage of some of the facilities. It is nice having a dedicated space and more computers than, I, than I'd be willing to put at home, honest. Uh, and so there's some of that in a whiteboard. But most of it is that I can talk to people, I can see people, I can have lunch with people if I don't have a lunchtime meeting. And I find that just enormously useful. There are people who, who are more introverted, more hermetic, and they don't, they don't have that need. Or they don't work so close. For me, it's a 20-minute it, drive to go into the office. There are days I don't go in. I will, I will fess up to that. If I have a 6 a.m. call, I may not make it in. Depends on what's going on. Yeah. When you work from home, do you still get to do like, you know, put on your work clothes or go out and just kind of work in your pajamas? Sometimes? Well, these these are my work clothes. I don't ever dress any better than this. And usually it's it's if the weather's a little warmer, it's a polo shirt and jeans often. So I do dress. I, I, I try not to take the call in my bathroom because I really do notice the difference there. Shoes not so much. Glasses, not so much. But I really do find it necessary. One of the interesting things on the, tel on the video conferencing, as I was working with a group that was rolling it out for some executive meetings that were global. Some of the people were saying, well, this will encourage the people in those other geographies not to take the call in their pajamas. And I was not happy with the way it was expressed. It sounded really snide. You know, they get to do it. it in their pajamas, but it really, it really does change your attitude a little bit. So I get dressed, and I have a, but on the other hand, I take the calls from the kitchen table. So it's not totally connected to the business world most of the time. And again, a headset really makes a difference because I can get up and have energy and move around and put it on mute and get coffee. That helps too. Yeah. I do. Do I need to repeat these for the YouTube? Okay. Do I find working out of the house more distracting than a dedicated space in the office? I do because I really, there are other things in the house that can distract me. I, I generally the only one in the house when I'm working, so I don't have distractions of family. But I, it, it put, I put on a different game face when I go into the office. It really is that for me. It's a, it's a work environment. At home, there's always the temptation. Oh, let me go get this little project started. Let me start some dishes. That's OK. Let me start recording this stuff so I can get rid of my old cassettes. That temptation keeps coming up, but it never gets acted on. That's why I still have the big piles of old cassettes. But I think about it. So, And at lunchtime, it's really a distraction, because then on a nice day like today, let me go out and take a walk at lunch and go someplace else instead of grabbing out of the fridge. So I find I'm a little more focused at work, and I've got a little bit better facilities at work at this point, I have more computers at work than I do at home. That's not always been the case. I've been in the other position sometimes where I've had better at home. But I've always found it helpful to go in because it really does reorient me. But I can work at home. And when the timing is right or wrong, I do. And it's a good, op it's a good option to have. Other questions? No, that was an entirely audio conference. They did actually have a camera. One of the things that, that we tend to do that I find ineffective, I really don't like, is that they'll have a conference with a critical mass in one room and, and other people on the phone. And that's OK if you're presenting. You're one of the people, and you're presenting from outside.
Well, thanks. Uh, it's great to be back. I, was, I taught here for eight years, and uh, uh, every time I drive onto the campus, I uh, wonder why I left. It's very pretty here. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, obviously, I'm a professor, too, and uh, uh, George told me not, not to walk around or I could cast a shadow. So I may not be able to help myself, so I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Anyway, my, uh, the title of my lecture is uh, Recursion Without Fear. This is uh, a, a talk that I've uh, de developed over the course of oh, probably 12 or 13 years. And uh, it's usually interactive, and it usually takes place over about an hour and a half. So this is compressed into 45 minutes, and it's not so interactive. But uh, we'll see if it gets the point across anyway. So um, it's recursion without fear. And if you read the description of the talk, you'll, you'll learn that uh, uh, you also notice that you will learn three magic tricks along the way. So watch for the magic tricks. OK, so it's Halloween. And so recursion seems to be a good topic to come up around Halloween because uh, nothing seems to strike fear in a programmer's uh, mind than the, the dreaded uh, R word, recursion. So I mean, how many of you can empathize with, uh, with, that, uh, with that thought? Or you're all just uh, completely, oh, recursion, I love that. I use it all the time. Or recursion, and then, and then you faint or something like that. OK. So how, how is it that we learn recursion? You may look back and dust off some things and try to remember how it was you learned or tried to learn recursion, learn something about it. Um, usually we're told what it is. And we see some examples of it. And then, allegedly, we're going to extrapolate from that. So OK, what have we been told that recursion is? That's, that's typically how it's taught. So here's the big question. What is it? Well, OK, now that's, <laughs> we haven't even seen the magic tricks yet. So it's not magic yet. But uh, OK, what is it? What's, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear recursion? What is it? OK, well, I know. not the jokes, but what, what is recursion? It is it's when a function calls itself, right? OK, you mean something like this? There's a function calling itself, right? OK, well, that usually, uh, usually you look at that and say kind of, whoa, all right? Doesn't necessarily immediately give you an idea of why you do it, but in any way, that's a function calling itself. OK, what else are we told that it is? Um, well, we're usually told that it's some sort of simple mathematical construct. There's recursive functions. And usually, we learn something like this. Does this look familiar to any of you? What's that? Close. What's that? That's the factorial function. Right? Factorial of n is 1 when n is otherwise f of n minus 1 when n is greater than 1. Ought to find for other ones. And the reason this is recursive is because OK. Um, any of you less? Fearful of recursion yet? What is it? Okay, we're usually told. Now, usually at some point, as the uh, maybe as you're still frustrated, somebody tells you it's the same as any other function. <laughs> and that's true. It is exactly the same as any other function. A call is made. An activation record is created at the time of the call. And what what's in the activation? There's two things of importance in the activation record. There is the return address, how to get back, and there's all the values of the local variables. And then when you return, those variables are restored. In fact, for a language to implement recursion, there's usually no need to do anything that isn't already being done. So it's just like another procedure call or function call. Okay. So basically, this way of teaching recursion is, well, you already know it. OK, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that helps either. 
What else? Well, beyond that, most of the time people will say, well, don't you know it yet? That's it. Uh, I actually had a professor once tell me, here's what recursion is. It's when two mirrors face each other. Like that. And you get that tunnel. And I don't know, if, if, if somebody tried to teach me recursion that way, I would say something, is this Java or is this uh, <laughs> plus plus? Uh, what does that have to do with programming? Um, I think something is missing in that way of learning recursion. Um, I don't necessarily think that kind of approach is going to enlighten you on, or enlighten anybody on recursion unless you're a genius and you make these extrapolations right away. So let's start over again, and I'm going to give you my answer of what is recursion, at least, at least what I think is a more helpful answer, and that is that it is a control structure. Once you decide that it's a control structure, what's it, what are other control structures that, that we know? What are some other control structures? If then, any others? Switch statement, that's kind of like an if then. While, okay, so you know some control structures. All right, how do you learn about control structures? Are you told how they're implemented? language or, you, or are you given a mathematical framework for them? That's not usually how we as humans learn how control structures work. We learn what they do and how to use them. And we practice. So let's start over with a new question. What does recursion do? find out. All right, here's that first recursion program that I threw up there. This is about the shortest recur recursive program that I think you could write, even in pseudocode. This is pseudocode here. So, because I left off the semicolons. All right, so this is a recursive program. What will this program do? You run it. Infinite loop. You guys agree with that? What was that? The figure stack up. So is it an infinite loop? If you run this program and implement it, what will it do? There you go. That's what it'll do. So it actually took you guys a fairly long time to answer that question, and this was the shortest recursion, recursive program that I could write. But that was good. You got it. That is what it will do. It may take it a few seconds, but it'll fill up your stack and then it'll tell you. It's not an infinite loop. It'll stop because it's doing something. It's making a gazillion activation records. And eventually there's no more room for them. And you get that. Okay. So that's not very useful to use that feature of recursion, right? But we know it's doing something. All right. Let's make it a little bit, let's, let's add some, a little bit to that piece of code. Here was our original piece of code, all right? Let's add something to it. Let's print something out in there. Okay? Same code, but I've added, I've added the print statement there. Now what's it going to do? It's going to print high until I get the stack overflow, right? So it's going to do something like this. And then I'd, I would need a lot more slides to display everything. But if we fast forward about a million slides or so, so eventually you'll get this. Now, this is actually a little bit more revealing than the last example, because the last example, all we saw was the stack overflow. This time, at least we know that getting called lots and lots of times. And then we get a stack overflow. All right, let's make the program a little bit more interesting. Let's make it stop. Now, 
To make recursion stop takes a long start. It was easy to make it start. To make it stop, you actually have to make something change. And the simplest way to make something change is to add a parameter that you change. And then check the parameter. So this is about the shortest recursive program that I could come up with that stops. So notice the difference. The last one didn't have this if in there, and it didn't have the parameter, and there wasn't the initialization of the parameter on the call. Okay. What's this program going to do? It's going to print high three or four times, something like that. Right? In fact, if you run this program, it's going to do that. Let's take a look at that code again. It's very important because now actually we're bringing recursion under control a little bit. Here. Okay, so this has, it has a parameter. Why? Because something has to change, otherwise it will stack overflow. If nothing changes, it will stack overflow. So something here has to change. The way to do that is to put a parameter, change the parameter, that's how you get the recursion to eventually stop. Also, the way we set it up may affect how many times we can get this thing to print high. Okay. Now, I'm going to add something to this code. And that is, instead of printing high, I'm going to print 10. That's the change of the code is I printed n instead of printing high. So now what is the code going to do? Okay, some of you already have the answer right here. Instead of printing high, 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 it's going to print 1, 2, 3, 4. See that? Let's go back to the code. First time through the through the first time into the code, n is 1, and that's what it's going to print. And it's going to call itself with n plus 1, so then it'll print 2 and so on, and we'll get one, two, three, four. Now, I'm going to make a key change to indicate this print in here. It's going to be exactly the same, except I'm going to also have print in after the call. Okay? Now what's it going to do? Okay, here's what it's going to do. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's take a look at that code there. Again, I have two print ends. We know what the first print end did. That made the 1, 2, 3, 4. That second print end must be making the 4, 3, 2, 1. In fact, if you were to remove this print end here, and you instead only had the print in here, which portion of this would print? Only the second half, the 4, 3, 2, 1. Because that first print in is what caused the 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so here's that code. I'm going to make one extra little change. Just to verify that, I'm also going to print the letter A for the first print and the letter B for the second print, just so we can make sure which print is responsible for printing which number. Okay? And we get this. All right, so that first print gave us the 1, 2, 3, 4. The second print gave us the 4, 3, 2, 1. Now, if you look at that code, um, the only difference between this print and this print are positioned relative to the recursive call. This print appears above the recursive call. This print appears after the recursive call. So we, we built ourselves a loop, call that loop A. That runs in the forward direction. And we got a loop B running in the backward direction. 
Now, for the whole rest of this lecture, this program right here is going to be the sort of the, the canonical program that illustrates the fundamental function, what recursion does. And what I've doing is I've got a version of this program in C and D that you can take. Hopefully, you know, there may not be enough to go around. I've got 30 copies of it. It's the same code except a C++ version and a Java version of exactly the same code. You'll see it's really not much bigger. There's a some semicolons and one says C out, and one says system out. That's about the only difference. Okay, so forward loop, backward loop. Oops, there's our there's our canonical recursive program that illustrates the behavior you get if you stick a recursive call in your program. And now we're down to the first magic trick. And that is when you put a recursive call in your code you get two loops for the price of one. One, one gives you two separate loops. If you want to make a loop that goes in the forward direction, simply place that code above the recursive call. If you want to make a loop that goes in the backward direction, simply place that code that you want to loop in the backward direction below the You don't have to use both of these loops. You can use oh, is it just short? If there's extras, there's looks like there's everybody I'm good. Okay. So I may refer to that occasionally. That that uh, so if you've got it in front of you, that's that's great. Okay, that's your first magic trick. Now the next thing is a bedtime story. I know that it's about lunchtime. If I did this at 2 o'clock, it would be disastrous. But uh, we should be safe if we do it now. This book was written in 1954 by Elizabeth Burroughs. And it's a cute little book. Uh, I think it was last in print about 15 years ago in a little tiny golden book that was about this big. But this is an over 50 years old book. I believe this book actually predates actual computers that implemented recursion. <laughs> were there any, George, were there any, any uh, languages that implemented recursion before 1954? Except Prankle Cool. Right. Okay. Here's the story. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. It was time to go to sleep. Oh, by the way, I have to admit, I didn't get permission from the publisher to display this. But I did get permission from the family of the author. Because I tried. I couldn't. I, the publisher won't write back to me. But I did talk to the family of the author. And they did give me permission. I don't know if that's legal or not. But um, OK, so once upon a time, there was a little girl. It was time to go to sleep, but she was not sleepy. Maybe she was just a tiny bit sleepy. She hopped into bed and covered herself up to her chin with her big red blanket. She said to her mother, tell me a story. So her mother said, once upon a time, there was a giraffe, a little giraffe with a long It was time to go to sleep. He was not sleepy. Well, maybe he was a tiny bit sleepy. He said to his mother, tell me a story. I like the picture. They have a house plant, and it's, it's, a, it's a palm tree. <laughs> Uh, so his mother said, once upon a time there was a fox, a little red fox with a big bushy tail. Time to go to sleep. He was beginning to be very sleepy. He said to his mother, tell me a story. So his mother said, once upon a time there was an elephant, a little gray elephant with a big trunk. It was time to go to sleep and she was beginning to be just a little bit sleepy. So she said to her mother, tell me a story.
She was a very sleepy little mouse. She said to her mother, tell me a story. I love this one. They, they made a sled out of the, out of the mouse trap. <laughs> and, and the little mouse is sleeping in a matchbook. I just love the pictures in this book. So her mother said, once upon a time, there was a pony, a little brown pony with a thick black mane. He was a sleepy, sleepy little pony. He yawned. Then he said to his mother, tell me a story. This is my favorite picture in the book. He took off his horseshoes before he went to sleep. <laughs> so his mother said, once upon a time, but the little brown pony did not hear. He was fast asleep. So was the little gray field mouse with the long skinny tail. So was the fluffy black puppy with the floppy ears. So was the little gray elephant with the big, big trunk. So was the little red fox with the big bushy tail. So was the little giraffe with the long, long neck. And so was the little girl all cuddled up in her big red blanket all fast asleep. Good night. <laughs> Isn't that a great book? I love that book. So now the obvious question, since you're all computer scientists, I'm, uh, would be, I bet I could write that story once using recursion. <laughs> Hopefully you detected the analogy with the previous examples, right? <laughs> <laughs> All the elements are there, actually, in that story. We should be able to do it. Why? Because there are two loops. One of them is going in the forward direction. That's this one. That's the part that was all those once upon a times. And it went the girl, then the giraffe, then the fox, then I don't, I don't remember all the order of the animals. Then there was another loop that was so was the, it was a so was the pony, so was the fox, so was the giraffe, and it ended up back at the beginning with so was the girl. That loop ran in a backward direction. Now I didn't mention this, but in your handout, on both of the examples and also in the pseudocode was an if statement where we were checking to see if it was time to stop that first loop, right? And what do we call that? That's the base case. Did this story have a base case? What was the base? What's that? Well, actually, that wasn't the base case. The little girl was a tiny bit sleepy. But uh, 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 with, do you remember which animal the base case actually hit on? It was the pony. And, and what was it about the pony that made it the base case? She was asleep. There was no need to tell the story because the pony was asleep. So the base case, there is a base case, and is, was the pony was asleep. All right? All right, so I think we can take this model right here and write this story much more efficiently maybe a little less artistically, but much more efficiently, something like this. <laughs> now you should be able to take your code, hold it up to that one, and make a virtual one-to-one -one correspondence between that canonical recursive code that we built and that you have sitting in front of you and this code. There's the program statement in the initial call. There's the definition of the function with a parameter. There's the portion of the code that we want to loop in the forward direction. Then there is the recursive call with a, that, that changes the parameter. There's a test on that parameter. And then comes the code that we want to run in the backward direction. The exact same structure as is on your handout. There's the code in red that goes in the forward direction. So that means we're going to say once there was a something, uh, such and such was the, whoever, whoever it is, was sleepy. So our mother said, that all goes one after another in the forward direction through the animals. This one the, happened after that first loop was done. Then started this loop. So was the pony, or not, no, it didn't say so was the pony. We actually had to doctor up the if statement a little bit so that it didn't say so was the pony. But I think it was so was the fox, so was the dog, so was the, the, the field mouse, and so on, backwards out to so was the girl. That one ran in the backward direction. And look at the key is 
where this code is positioned in the function relative to the recursive call. The recursive call is here. Any code that runs before it will loop in the forward direction. Any code that appears after it will loop in the backward direction. If we run this program, oh, well, I guess we have one little detail, and that is these x's. Where are we going to get this data? Well, let's see. We want to start with the first animal, which is the girl. And then for the next story, we want to go to the next animal. There's different ways we could set that up. Let's, let's do it the simplest way. Let's try an array. So for the book, we could have an array, say, with, uh, there's, there's, it turns out there's seven uh, animals in this uh, story. Um, that maybe we could use three parallel arrays, zero to six. The first one has the actual type of the animal. The second one has, uh, each animal had a different uh, attribute. So like the girl had a red blanket, the giraffe had a long neck, the pony had a thick mane. And then the, the, the last one was how sleepy they were. And of course, our base case is going to be testing for asleep because that's what's going to stop the loop is when we hit the asleep. If we do this and we set it up that way, I could write that story in C++. Here's the sleepy story in C++. And again, you should be able to take your code, hold it up to that, and match it pretty much perfectly. Uh, I, did, I did take the liberty of reducing the number of animals from seven to four so that it would fit on the slide. But if you want to make this all seven animals, you could just add those animals to the arrays. So at the beginning, I've declared an array called kid, which are all the different animals and how sleepy they are in this array called sleep. I didn't take the liberty of putting the attribute red blanket and that in, but that could be easily added. Um, and I've only did it, did it for four of the seven animals. But here's the recursive program, which, and here's the main down here, because C++ likes, likes to uh, have the main. Well, I could put the main up, but then I'd have to forward reference the story. And so it's simpler to put the main at the bottom. And, um, and my parameter is going to be an index into the array. So the first time through, I'm going to tell the story on the zeroth animal. And A will be zero, and that'll refer to kid zero and sleepiness zero, which will be girl and awake. Here is the recursive call right here, story A plus one. So here's the recursive call right here. Here's the portion of the code that I want to go in the forward direction. Once there was a girl, she was awake. Her mother said, OK, then we continue. Obviously, it's a slightly simplified version of the story. I wanted it to fit on the slide. Um, here's the base case and the call. Um, where's the call? Here's the, here's the base case and the call. Uh, here is, after the recursive call, the portion of the program that will loop in the backward direction. So was the, and notice that the item here that I'm going to print is ex identical to the item here. So that the first time through it'll say girl, and then on the way out it'll also say girl. Two loops, one control structure. In this case, I'm using both of the loops. If all I wanted to do was had a story that said, so was the, so was the, so was the, so was the, for those animals going backwards, I could just remove this code. If I didn't want the so was the, and all I wanted was the once upon a times, I could remove this code. Any questions about this, this, uh, this little piece of code here? Can you, can you see by taking your canonical example what corresponds to what on there? OK, let's carry on. When you run it, it looks like this.
forward loop down to here. The base case test caused this, and then I get the backward loop through the animals. Okay, so I wrote the story once recursively, and there it is when it runs the forward loop, then the backward loop. To make this, the the, the base case here was a little convoluted. It ended up being an if-then-else because there was a special case. In the case of the pony, we say something different. So that particular base case I had took a little bit more code than your canonical example. If you have to handle the base case separately, then you just put it in that if. You, you deal with it there. OK. What if we didn't use an array? What if we used a linked list? What if we had a linked list of objects, say, instead of an array? Let's just say a simple forward linked list. So an object has an animal, a sleepiness, and a next. Simple forward linked list. What would change about the program? Well, instead of saying, instead of indexing how sleepy an animal is with this array subscript, I would instead be using a, um, a field indicator with a dot. And then, instead of going to a plus 1, I would need to go to a dot next. And my definitions would change at the very beginning. I wouldn't have arrays. I would have to set up a linked list. Other than setting up the linked list, these are the only things that would change. Is how I, how I print something out, because obviously it won't be an array. It'll be a field. Um, that's here. Um, and how I, how I go on to the next one. OK, so but. I have to do that backward. The so was, the so was, the so was, the so was, the. I have to go backwards. That second part of the story goes so was, the so was, the so was, though, and it's going backwards. It has to go backwards through the animals, right? So, but my linked list only goes forwards. Do I need to add some backward links so that that second loop can go backwards? The answer is no. So when you've traversed the linked list, when you've had to, I'm sure you've had to work with linked lists. If you're in a situation where you have to traverse the linked list both ways, or if you've got a linked list and you need to traverse it backwards, invariably what happens is you think, oh, I've got to go add backward links. And my data structure is going to be more complicated. It turns out, in this case, we don't. That's the second magic trick. You can tra traverse a linked list backwards without backlinks using recursion. Because in that initial, in that program with the sleepy story, we could have printed just the so was the, or in your hand, in your code here, if, uh, if, you, if you changed it to where instead of just incrementing a number and printing that out, you had it walking through a linked list. You, you could, it will go down that list in the forward direction, and then as it's popping the stack, you'll go backward through it in the backward direction. And if all you wanted to do was traverse it in the backward direction, what would you have to do? Close. If all you wanted to do was go in the backward direction, you would place the code where? You would put your code after the recursive call. So if you need to traverse a linked list backwards and you don't have backed links, you can do it with recursion. You start your function with the, rec with the recursive call that takes you to the next element, and then any, the code that you want to process on each element you place after the recursive call, because that's where you get the backwards loop, is in the code that appears after the recursive call. That traversal, the backward, is being handled for you by the runtime stack. 
Okay, now I promised you three magic tricks, and there's one more magic trick to show you. I claim that none of the programs that I've shown you have any variables in them. Uh, now, you probably are thinking, uh, Scott, now you've finally gone berserk, because I can see some variables there, and I can see a variable there. Right? That looks like an integer variable called a. And that looks like a very complicated variable, that array variable called kid, and that other array variable called SLP. OK, those aren't variables. Those are constants. If I stick the word const in front of every one of those things, the program still works the same. What's a variable? A variable is something that changes. What does it mean for a variable to change? That means that you, you uh, say, put it on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. Now, you might say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You are incrementing the variable right here. You're saying, aha, I've got you now, Scott. That is not an assignment statement. That's an expression. That is evaluated. A is not changed. If A is 4, A will still be 4 after that statement is done. In fact, it's very important that it still be 4 so that on the backward loop, we print out the fourth kid. This does not change A. Um, in fact, um, this, uh, this uh, will generate the value 5, and then 5 will be used to initialize the constant in the next iteration. Yes? No, A++ uh, would be a bad idea. In fact, A++ is, uh, uh, would indeed uh, violate, uh, in fact, it would kind of mess up our, uh, if we used A++, it would mess up the whole structure. Because not only, it, it would work fine until we, it would work fine in the forward direction, but then it would screw up the backward direction if we did A++. Because then when we went on the backward direction, then, um, uh, what would happen is when we, when we printed so was the, this would be a different kid on the way out. We, it's, it's important that this A, or, or uh, that it stays the same, uh, so that we get the backward loop on the same items. Okay? So here's our third magic trick. You don't even need any variables. All right, so did you imagine that did you ever imagine that you could traverse a forwardly linked list backwards without you even using any variables? I think that's a magic trick. But recursion lets you do it. Basically, when you do a recursive call, um, it generates these, these loops, the run and, and one of them is being handled by the runtime stack, and, and your code is sort of along for the ride. You've got some code that's along for the ride above the, above the call that's going to run in the forward direction. Any code that appears after the call is along for the ride in the backward direction. You can piggyback off one or both of those. The author of that book, by the way, Elizabeth Burroughs, um, died in 1975. She lived most of her life in Stockton, California. And her son uh, became a pioneering computer scientist. Um, she herself was not a scientist, but uh, I did speak with her grandson, who said that she was a very, very intriguing uh, woman who had a lot of interest in science and math and, uh, and, uh, um, and was interested in all things uh, uh, technical and new. And that, I think that shows pretty well in, in her book. That, uh, her, her book foreshadowed <laughs> recursion so, so clearly. All right, that's, that's it. Well, I, guess, I guess my other magic trick was I finished four minutes early. I was, uh, <laughs> I was imagining. Yes? Did you give her grandson a copy of your program? <laughs> that's true. I could say, look, I've improved her, her story. I've made it much more efficient. You can now publish it in one page. The kiddies will love this version. <laughs> In fact, yes. Plus 
SCA, you'd have the same problem because it, it will, it will still increment. Well, no, actually, if that's a, that's an interesting question, we could we could answer that question by looking at the uh, at this code here. If we said plus plus a, um, the interesting thing is that it would not damage this because it will have already printed it out for a. But it will, in fact, increment a, and whether we have the plus plus before or after, it's still going to increment the a before it executes this code. And so the backward loop will still be incorrect for the same reason as if it were A++. However, let's see. When you do plus plus A on a call in C++, I don't remember whether it increment. Well, it would have to increment then before it makes the call. So it would, have, it would make the same, same error. Yeah. Uh, good question. You can keep these, by the way. I don't, I don't, I don't need them back. Oh, those are extras. Okay. Um, by the way, if you uh, if you uh, there are languages that don't allow you to use variables. Um, for instance, uh, Scheme, or um, I, I did. And I, and I, and in case you think that that is uh, unusually restrictive, all of my graduate work and all of my experiments, which involved uh, mostly uh, genetic algorithms, but also some neural networks. I wrote all of my code in a language called Sisal, which was a pure functional language, single assignment, no variables, no loops. And uh, so that is not an undue restriction. Recursion gives you all the looping behavior that you need. Um, and so if you, under, if you understand uh, you know, the power, and, and, but it takes some practice. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that now I have anointed you with this uh, magical skills. Um, because it still takes practice to uh, to leverage that. Yes. So the question is, do you have performance benefit using recursion? Generally, not. Usually, you take a performance hit because the same loop you can usually write more efficiently yourself. So you do it just to kind of simplify the algorithm. You can use it to simplify your algorithm. You could use it because the language requires it. Uh, sometimes it can dramatically simplify your algorithm, and these days, m more and more of our programs don't require, don't have performance requirements. Uh, um, back 30 years ago, almost all programs had performance requirements, and you had to write them efficiently; otherwise, you'd be in trouble. These days, the number of programs for which performance is a is a, is a serious issue is gradually going down. So you can get away these days with writing more elegant code. Um, but uh, no, you wouldn't necessarily want to always use recursion if you didn't have to. But uh, but you shouldn't shy away from it just because it's scary. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for the great questions. You were a great audience.